Hi, everybody. Judy, the YouTube lawyer here. Our special guest today is attorney Seth Bloom, who is a very special person in my life. He gave me a job when I first moved to North Carolina. So thank you, Seth, for being here. Um, he is also a very experienced criminal defense attorney. So feel free to ask your questions in the chat box. He's a graduate of Duke Law School as well as Tufts University. So thank you, Seth, for being here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. Sure. Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself first? Well, uh, I have been in my current position since 93. Uh, Howard Kurtz and I founded the firm uh, January 93. Uh, sorry, January 98. In 93, mm -hmm. I started the public defender's office in Fayetteville. Uh, mm -hmm. I was also a public defender in uh, Chapel Hill. North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I do almost exclusively criminal defense. Uh, a lot of, uh, well, essentially anything from speeding to murder uh, we handle. And uh, we, uh, the, the uh, other things to know about me are that I am also a professor at, uh, at uh, UNC where I teach trial advocacy. And uh, I also teach some seminars in trial advocacy, which essentially means just how to how do you try a case? How do you how do you do a trial? Mm -hmm. uh, and I am a theater guy. So uh, I've done quite a few, uh, quite a lot of theater and quite a lot of uh, uh, film is more of what we're working on now. Mm -hmm. And I live with four professional actors uh, who are all my my wife and my children. Uh, are all in stuff you've probably seen uh, on television and film. Oh, great. Okay. Well, can you tell us what are some of your favorite roles? Oh, sure. Uh, I've done quite a lot of Shakespeare, but uh, and, and I've done some of the big roles in Shakespeare. I've done Hamlet, Richard III. Uh, but my favorite is Iago, who is... Uh, generally recognized as the the worst person in all of Shakespeare, the, the most evil villain that Shakespeare wrote. And it's just a lot, a lot of fun. For some reason, I get cast in, in villain roles a lot. Oh, okay. Yeah. So do you think your acting has also helped you become a better trial attorney? Undoubtedly, yes. There mm -hmm. is some uh, overlap in knowing how to speak and knowing how to present oneself, how to move around with comfort. It also helps me teach better because part of uh, essentially what I'm teaching when I teach trial advocacy is how to tell a story in a convincing way. And uh, that's what acting is all about. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I think people are really interested in your experience as a criminal defense attorney, though, because we have a lot of true crime buffs here. So sure. um, how did you become a public defender? Well, right out of law school, I, I graduated from Duke and I went right to the public defender's office in Fayetteville. And for those of you who haven't visited Fayetteville, it is a great place to be a criminal defense attorney because there's uh, quite a lot of crime. And yeah. the public defender's office, when I first got there, was nationally known. Uh, it was a great place to train. And we were all in slightly above our heads. So we were we were working constantly and there, there were a cadre of folks who had been there for a while who were available to guide us. Uh, but we we all moved up very, very quickly. I started uh, I started on tr simple stuff, DWIs and well, not that they're simple, but DWIs and uh, driving license revoked. And uh, by the second year, I was working, <clears throat> excuse me, working on my first murder case. Wow, that sounds pretty stressful, actually. Yeah. Well, I mean, so you actually grew up in the suburbs of Atlanta, just like mm -hmm. I did, right? So you would say it's probably like middle, upper middle class, and then you went to Tufts for college. Probably. So mm -hmm. was it a shock or culture shock to suddenly be thrown into Fayetteville, North Carolina? Uh, well, in fairness, I had gone to uh, to school at Duke, so it wasn't. Uh, I, I have uh, a good friend who was a public defender in Fayetteville and who was there for many years. And uh, after a, a while, he 
and his family moved to Durham. And when people heard that he was moving to Durham, they said, oh, there's so much crime. You're going to be, are you going to be okay? Are you going to be okay? And where are you coming from? And they, he, they told him, well, we came from Fayetteville. And everyone was like, oh, you'll be fine. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, the, the one time that I was really a victim of, of crime was living in Durham. We, our, our apartment got broken into uh, while I was in law school. And we lived right on the edge of, of safe and scary. Um, so, I mean, no, it wasn't entirely a culture shock. I, I had had some exposure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, were most of your clients people that were somehow associated with Fort Bragg or the military? Not most. Um, not most, but quite a few were, were soldiers. Uh, soldiers tended to be disciplined by the military. Uh, already. And, and mm -hmm. so we only were brought in when there was a crime that was committed off base. Uh, and there were a lot of sexual assaults that were committed by something about becoming a sergeant, I think, led people to uh, go out and commit sexual assaults on their family members usually. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, there, there were a handful and they were significant, but no, they weren't the majority. Mm hmm. Okay. Well, I'm interested in hearing about your first murder case when you were, what, one year out of law school? Two years. Gosh, oh. it's a long time ago, Judy. Uh, oh, you remember? Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I've done yes. a lot of murder cases since then. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know that I can recall the details of that one. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you that I represented a, uh, a soldier who tried to kill somebody uh, who uh, was dating a uh, somebody he thought was physically a woman uh, for a while and brought his girlfriend back to the base. And then one day on the dance floor discovered maybe not equipped as a woman. <laughs> uh, a yeah. And, uh, well, I mean, physically, I, I, mm -hmm. not, not qualified to say what gender this person was, but, uh, but physically male. Mm -hmm. And um, he was embarrassed and humiliated and uh, was accused later of trying to shoot that person. Uh, and there was, um, I mean, that, was, that, was, that one went to trial. That was pretty interesting. Uh, and uh, we kind of relied on the prejudices of the, of the jury and for that one, because uh, I think the, the evidence was a little bit iffy, but the jury just really disliked the victim. And, uh, uh, you know, sometimes you can use that to your advantage. So what happened? Well, uh, the, the, sorry. Did the person get acquitted? Oh yeah. Yeah. He, really? he was found, yeah, he was found not guilty. Um, and I later learned that, uh, he was, he did not, and, and the victim went on to, to live her life. Um, uh, but that person, I, I later got a call from a, a friend who worked at the um, the uh, Capitol Defender's Office, where they do nothing but murders, who called to tell me that he had been arrested for a murder later on and to tell me that if I hadn't done such a good job, <laughs> that, uh, you know, somebody else might be alive. Um, uh, so, uh, yes, he was acquitted in the case that I had. I don't believe he was acquitted later. Mm hmm. Okay. Well, um, have there been other cases where you kind of personally felt that the person probably did do it, but you were able to get the person acquitted? Uh, yes. I mean, uh, that, that does happen with some regularity where, where people are accused of things that they probably did, but that the state's uh, evidence is, is insufficient one way or another. Um, I had a, I had a case where, uh, my client was accused of being one of three people who were involved in a robbery of two men. And the, the two co-defendants both came forward and testified that my guy had committed the crime and the two victims of the robbery came forward and, uh, identified my client, but well, I'm sorry, one of them identified my client. The other said that he had his head down the entire time and he couldn't identify anybody. So it was really only one uh, victim ID. And the vic and I was able to show the jury that um, of the two co-defendants, one of them was just a sheep who was following the, the second co-defendant. The leader of the, of the group 
had uh, written a bunch of letters telling his girl, he, he had been convicted and he'd gone to prison. And he was very nervous and, and worried that my client was horning in on his girlfriend. And he kept writing letters, which we got a hold of, to his girlfriend, uh, telling her to stay away from my client and that uh, that he was going to, that if he didn't, that he was going to get revenge on him. So I was able to use those letters to undercut the credibility of that witness in testifying that my client had committed the crime. And then the the victim who testified that he recognized my client said that he knew my client because he had seen him walking around before he had approached the uh, the car where the, the two victims had been. And before he had pulled out, before the three men had pulled out guns and, and, and robbed them. And that he was sure that it was my client because he had seen my client wearing a red sweatshirt and he sees that red sweatshirt uh, every time he thinks about it and he knows that and he associates it with my client. So I had, of course, a statement that he had given to the police and I was able to ask him, are you sure it was a red sweatshirt? He said, yeah, absolutely sure. Uh, and I asked, you see that red sweatshirt when you close your eyes at night? You, you, first thing you think of in the morning? Yes, yes, that's right. Um, you're never going to forget it's a red sweatshirt. No, just like you're, you're as sure that it's a red sweatshirt as you are that this man sitting next to me is the man that robbed you. He says, yes, absolutely. And then I asked, "Are you? would you be surprised to learn that you told the police it was a blue sweatshirt? And he was said, no, 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 red, absolutely red. I had no further questions. Next witness up was the police officer who had done the interview, who sat down immediately and said, yeah, he told me blue sweatshirt. Uh, and they that was enough to, to give the jury reasonable doubt. And they did not convict. Mm hmm. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I'm sure you have lots of war stories. Uh, one of the people watching is actually another criminal defense attorney who is very experienced. Thank you for being here, criminal law. He said people literally would not believe the crazy things some people do and the sure. way that some would-be victims take the law into their own hands can be interesting. It's true. It's yeah. true. Um, I, I had one of the worst things that we come across and we come across it fairly frequently is a situation where neighbors are in dispute with one another because people just go crazy, good people, nice people, uh, just go nuts. And when they, when they live next to somebody who irritates them, uh, and they will, I, I, on several occasions, I've heard of people putting up cameras and kicking down fences and hurting each other's pets and, uh, uh, just horrible stuff that you you wouldn't expect from professional people, from accountants and teachers and uh, uh, people who, uh, you know, by all accounts, appear to be kind and reasonable in their daily lives, but they just go nuts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they wind up becoming your clients, they right? Wind, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, in the last 30 years that you've been practicing law, do you feel like society has become more violent and evil? No, I, I, no I, I, thing, I, I absolutely do not. I absolutely do not. Uh, uh, I think that, uh, I mean, well, in fairness, I went from Fayetteville, which is a more violent place to uh, Raleigh Durham. But, um, but no, I, I, I don't think that at all. I, I think that, uh, I, I actually think the crime has gone down and I think people are less violent. Uh, so, uh, no, I, I, I think we've been moving in the right direction as far as, as far as that goes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So it could just be that now we have more social media. Mm -hmm. Everybody's watching different things from other States. So we get this general impression that, oh my gosh, there are so many people out there killing their spouses or plotting to murder family members and all these sordid crimes. Sure. I think what has happened uh, in the last 30 years has been, is, is that there's a, uh, there are a lot more cameras. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got a camera on them all the time and they're, it's gotten a lot cheaper to record everything. And the police have cameras on them all the time and they have dash cameras all the time. And in situations where we used to have to take the police at their word, uh, we don't anymore. We now can watch what really happened. It took a little while and I, maybe we're still going through this transition for police to remember people are watching us all the time. And I think that's a big part of why we have, we, there was a, uh, 
series, uh, maybe still going on, of police violence being exposed. I, I, I am confident that it had been going on for the since there were police, uh, you know, for hundreds of years. But now it's undeniable because it's on camera, and and that has made a huge difference. Uh, it's also made a huge difference in every DWI case that there is video of the way that the accused people are behaving. And we don't have to take the police officer's word for it, but we also can show it to the people who really do look drunk. And they, I, I've had a number of people ask me to stop uh, two thirds of the way through and say, okay, I get it. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, definitely. It's made a difference also in domestic violence court too, Ooh. where voila, there's like some, cell phone footage or security camera footage and yep. it's like oh okay maybe you better agree to this consent order you yeah. know that happens so helen has a good question here does anyone tell you the truth that they did the crime and you win the case uh so helen i guess i would have to be a little bit careful about what we mean by win the case uh sometimes being a being a criminal defense attorney means that we, we we win in all kinds of ways. Sometimes a win is minimizing the amount of prison that someone gets, or sometimes a win is keeping somebody out of prison. Uh, but sometimes a win is being found not guilty. Of course, that that can be the best thing uh, for the client. I think you have to be a little bit realistic, though, about what you are doing for the person. The uh, Let's say we, we win a case and, and a person's found not guilty, and they are sent right back into the uh, the milieu that they were in that led them to get in trouble in the first place. I mean, that I haven't changed somebody's life. I may, I may have protected them against that current crisis, but I haven't changed their lives. Uh, and it's not my job to try to change their lives most of the time. But when somebody comes in and they, let's say, have a serious drug issue and there are... Uh, uh, things that we can do to put them in a position where they can change their lives, where they can get treatment or they can get uh, out of the terrible place where they've lived and away from the forces that are driving them to either deal drugs or use drugs or both. Uh, then, I mean, I feel like that's a win, even if the person ends up getting, even if the person ends up getting convicted. Uh, I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's a that's a great way to think about it. You know, sometimes people do need that kick in the pants, mm -hmm. you know, to be sent to jail or sent to prison or have to do the whatever the rehab program or anger, anger management classes. Yeah, those things matter. I, I had a kid just uh, recently who is uh, 16 and, and accused of fleeing to a felony, fleeing to a loot. Uh, because he was drinking a little. He wasn't drunk, but he was drinking a little bit. And then he was out with his friends. He was driving. He was being an idiot, as many 16-year-olds are. I'm, I am shocked that I survived childhood, but uh, uh, given, given some of the dumb stuff that I did. But he um, he was doing dangerous stuff. And he, as a result of getting accused immediately, because he has good, caring parents, uh, went out and got some uh, get a, uh, treatment for alcohol use and alcohol abuse and uh, some psychiatric treatment. And we were able to work out a plea deal where he and he did end up pleading to uh, what's called driving after consuming under 21, which means not full on DWI, but drinking even a little bit when you're under 21. And he and both of his parents have, have said to me, this saved his life and uh, and changed the trajectory. And uh, I really do believe in a, in a case like that, it is going to make a big difference for him. Mm -hmm. uh, so sometimes sometimes we can make a big difference. Yeah, that's good to hear. Yeah. Well, getting back to your time as a public defender, did you mm -hmm. also represent juveniles? Just a little, just a mm -hmm. little. When I first started, uh, I handled cases where children had been committed to the local mental health uh, mm -hmm. uh, institution, and they generally were kept there until their insurance ran out, and then they suddenly were better and were released, uh, according to the hospital. Uh, uh, so that's, but that's really the only time that I've run into that. It's not part of mm -hmm. 
not part okay. of it. Yeah, I just assumed that's what they would put the young attorneys on first, and then you kind of move your way up. We no, no not in Fayetteville at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, how did you even learn how to practice law then? Were you assigned to a mentor or some but some senior person? It's a really great question. Uh, so there was uh, a little bit of training where we did some mock trial uh, work, but mostly I watched other people. I asked a lot of questions. I did a lot of reading and I hung out in court and I watched what good lawyers did and what bad lawyers did is more of a cautionary tale. Mostly, I tried to learn from the, the good lawyers, and we all knew who they were. And because I was in a, a, a place where there were people who had a lot of experience and who were truly dedicated, uh, I had a lot of people I could ask questions to. But my my boss would tell me, um, you know, don't come to me unless you've read the statute. And, uh, and then once you've read it, I'm happy to answer any questions. So uh, I read a lot. And, and in the first year or two or you know, three, uh, you have to, you just have to read and read and read and read. There's just a, an enormous amount to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that sounds like kind of trial by fire, you know, from what I've heard of other people who are public defenders, that you're just kind of given a bunch of cases like, hey, go do something. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Figure it yeah. out. Figure yeah. it out. And my, my boss at the time also said, and there's some wisdom to it, you, you, uh, you learn on the broken bones of your clients. You, at the beginning, you know, I, I, I don't know that I did anybody any good until I had been doing it for about a year or 18 months. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, 18 months, that's still pretty fast though, to kind of pick up speed and know what yeah. you're doing. They're, yeah. they're like dog years. You, you just, yeah. you know, that you, exactly. you do a lot in that time. Yeah. So you were there for how many years? You said six years? Or? No, no, no. I was at the public defender's office in Fayetteville for a total of about two years and in the uh, the Chapel Hill office for about a year. Oh, OK. Yeah, I totally forgot you worked in Chapel Hill. So mm -hmm. what made you switch? Uh, well, my wife at the time. Uh, so um, I went to school in Durham. She was working in Durham as uh, an ESL teacher at mm -hmm. uh, Wake Tech. And when I got the job in Fayetteville, we got a house halfway between, uh, which is about 45 minute commute for each of us. And about two years into it, she said, they're moving me from the campus where I am to the other campus on the other side of Raleigh. My commute, if I stayed here, would become uh, an hour and 15 or an hour and a half uh, and I'm going to move to Raleigh and I would really like you to come with me. And oh. so I, I got another job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how is it different? Because I'm assuming Chapel Hill is more like college students, people associated. I mean, there, with there are a certain people. number of college. The Chapel Hill was, ugh, Chapel Hill, I, I always think of as the place where good public defenders get to go when they die. Uh, Cause it is just a, a great place. I mean, Fayetteville is a great place to practice law. To look to learn to be a lawyer, the the lawyers, uh, other the rest of the bar is very supportive and uh, and caring. Uh, the the office in Chapel Hill is just terrific. The great lawyers, but uh, the prosecutors, uh, at least when I was there, really tried to do the right thing. Uh, they they uh, cared uh, uh, about truth and justice and, and all that good stuff. And uh, the police really tried to do the, the right thing. And with just a few exceptions, I just didn't feel like they needed me. I, I, uh, I, I felt like the right thing was going to happen no matter what. And, uh, and so it, it, it didn't feed my need uh, to, to feel like I was making a difference. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds interesting. Yeah. yeah. I don't think most people think that the system works that way. So. Well, uh, we there were really good people in place at that time. And uh, and they were well, I, I, they were really good people in place at that time. Yeah, yeah. But as a public defender, did you ever feel like you were totally overwhelmed and didn't oh, yeah. have enough time to devote to your clients? Absolutely. Yeah. I all the time. That that was the worst part of the job. I, I loved being a public defender. But uh, the worst part of the job was that the caseload was thoroughly overwhelming and uh, you really couldn't put the 
the time that you needed into uh, all of the cases. Uh, I, I really, especially in Fayetteville, I, I worried and still do that the demands of the job were requiring an unconstitutional level of uh, work being being put on each of us. Uh, there, there just isn't a way to do the job to the in the way that it should be done. Mm -hmm. Well, what about funding? I mean, you always hear about public defenders making peanuts, but did you have some sort of budget also as to getting experts for big cases? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and actually, that was um, that was always an issue uh, as to how we could justify uh, the expense. But uh, but yes, there the the public funds, public coffers were were open to the uh, the folks that we represent. This is this is a real issue in criminal defense. The the people, rich people have all the money they need. You don't have to worry about it. Whatever you need, they can afford. Uh, every expert, every uh, every jury consultant, uh, mm -hmm. if, if you have unlimited funds, you can get it. And on the bottom, the, the terribly poor, the people who qualify for uh, public defenders have access to public funds. The, the folks in the middle, most of us, uh, don't qualify for the money that the state allots for uh, public defenders and for public funding for experts. And uh, the folks in the middle really get stretched and, uh, and, and can't uh, often afford uh, the, the things that would, that would make things fair. Mm -hmm. Well, how poor how poor do people have to be to qualify to get public defenders? Uh, I I don't know the numbers, but I think it's the 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 program is meant for people at poverty level. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's like set by the government or the yeah. feds. Uh, the the judges are given guidelines. People who are applying for public defenders uh, have to fill out an affidavit of indigency meaning that they have to write out a questionnaire about what their income is and what their expenses are. And then the, they hand that up to the judge. The judge looks at it and decides, can this per... And, and it, it, it'll be dependent in part on what they're accused of. Uh, but the judge then decides, can this person actually afford to hire a lawyer of their own or, or can they not? And there are some cases, a, a murder case, nobody can afford a, a, the, a lawyer. So everybody automatically gets appointed a public defender, and then occasionally people will hire somebody uh, out of pocket, but it, it, it's very rare for people mm -hmm. to be able to afford to do that. Yeah. And um, this has been kind of a big question in the Dan Markell case was how did one of the uh, convicted killers afford to have three attorneys working for her? People are assuming that the rich Adelson family, who is believed to be behind Dan Markell's murder must have paid for her attorneys. So are you able to guess how much people might charge for a first degree murder case? Oh, is it a death case? I mean, yeah. something where death penalty is on yeah. the line? Or, well, no death penalty, but life oh, in prison. Life in prison? Yes. Uh, I murder. mean, I, 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 and where is that case at? Where did oh, that it was in Tallahassee, Florida. Okay. So it's probably comparable to Raleigh. I hear yeah. the the it would cost minimum hundred thousand dollars and probably something closer to a quarter million mm -hmm. per attorney mm -hmm. or for a group yeah. of three attorneys. Are the are they all in the same firm? Um, well, two of them, the two Kawas sisters, were from the same firm. The other guy seemed to have maybe his own solo practice. I mean, I don't know what kind of deal they worked out, but uh, yeah. but I, I would I would expect probably, you know, per lawyer something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's not many people can do it. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, some people were saying, well, you know, maybe she got money because her mother died from life insurance proceeds and family members, community support. You know, could who be. Knows? But um, yeah, I mean, have a you lot heard of community of support. Yeah, I don't think she had that much community support, but um, have there been instances where people did all sorts of weird things to try to pay your legal fees? 
I don't know about weird things. Uh, I do yeah. think that people often call on their family and their community for, for help in that situation. Uh, a lot of people don't realize sometimes a, an umbrella policy or a homeowner's policy will pay some or all of the fee uh, for an attorney if you need uh, to do that. So uh, people would be wise to look at their insurance policies. But otherwise, I think folks mostly ask for help from their, their friends and loved ones. And yeah, like I said, very few people can afford to pay out of pocket. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I had no idea homeowners insurance could pay for even criminal cases. Mm -hmm. I know about civil cases, civil lawsuits, yeah. but not criminal. Yeah. Oh, well, that's I mean, good. Not, not yeah. everyone, not all of them, but some. Yeah. Them. Yeah. I'm sure they have a bunch of exclusions. So, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. This is a good question. Mary asks, with incriminating technology, evidence, DNA, photos, GPS, et cetera, when does Attorney Bloom encourage the client to possibly accept a plea deal? Sure. Uh, so there's always a, a balancing test. Uh, uh, people uh, are not always well served by going to trial, especially in a case where they would be convicted. Usually people who go to trial and lose get punished more heavily than people who work something out. So mm -hmm. if we believe that the client is really uh, in danger of getting convicted, then we would encourage them to consider a plea deal. If the plea deal is unreasonable, then then we, we push back. And if we can't get something reasonable, then we uh, sometimes go to trial. Um, I had a, a case... Um, it's probably been 15 years ago now, where this young man was accused of breaking in with his friends into a house. And the policy of the prosecutor's office uh, at that time was any residential uh, breaking in, either, either at night or during the day, would always result in a felony uh, offer. They would, they would never come off of it. And my client was uh, very young. I think he was probably 16 or 17. Uh, and oh, and to answer the confusion, if people are wondering, didn't I just say I don't do juvenile cases? At the time that we did those, anybody 16 or older was treated as an adult for uh, criminal court. So the prosecutor for the 16 or 17 year old would not offer him a misdemeanor. And, and it, he'd never been in trouble. He was a good student. He had a bright future. And I wouldn't do it. I, I just absolutely refused. We went to trial. <laughs> because they would not offer a misdemeanor in that case. And we ended up hanging the, the jury. The, the, um, uh, the, the facts in that case were the co-defendants testified that my client was uh, uh, involved and uh, his father was able to testify that his son had explained that he was with his friends. His friends were going to break into a place that my client went home during the breaking and entering and then met his friends later and got arrested with everybody else. And the jury at least thought that was plausible enough that they didn't convict him. And then once we had worked, once we um, had gone through a trial and the jury wasn't convinced beyond a reasonable doubt, the prosecutor offered a misdemeanor and we ended up pleading guilty to the misdemeanor, which is what I thought was the reasonable offer uh, to begin with. I think there's always a right price. You know, there's always, the, there's always a deal that there's always the right plea. Sometimes the plea is case dismissed. Um, and sometimes the plea is, uh, I plead guilty, please, please, please have mercy on me. But usually there is something in the middle that we ought to agree to. And when there isn't, it's because somebody doesn't have a realistic picture of what's going to happen at the trial. Uh, and uh, with incriminating technology and photos and videos and DNA, uh, uh, we often have bigger uh, piles of evidence that we have to go against. But there is also a phenomenon where now, because of all the uh, true crime and, and the police procedurals and, and you know, CSI and NCSI, uh, juries have an expectation that they're going to see video and they're going to see DNA. And when they don't see it, they, they are less inclined to find beyond a reasonable doubt that the that the police uh, prove the case. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, well, how does the process work, though, 
does the defense attorney usually make the first move to try to make a yeah. deal? Uh, I guess it depends on the case. The The process is that we we get to a point where we get the discovery. The discovery is the uh, report of uh, the information that the prosecution has to provide, telling us what the case is about and what their evidence consists of. And we we look through it. We see if we think that there's anything missing. We, we interview uh, witnesses independently to see if they actually are going to uh, repeat and uphold the statement that they gave to the police uh, when they were interviewed. And then we talk about whether we think this is going to be enough to convict. And if we think that there is a problem with the state's case, uh, then we'll think about whether uh, we think a jury is likely to convict. Usually the state will make an offer. In fact, almost always, the state will make an offer of some kind. If we think the offer is reasonable, we'll tell our client. If we think the offer is not, the offer is not reasonable, but we, but it's close, then we can negotiate back and forth. And if we're able to get to something that the client can live with, then we work something out. And if not, uh, that's when we go to trial. Mm -hmm. Well, does it kind of change when somebody has a private privately retained attorney versus a public defender? Like, do you feel like privately retained attorneys are less likely to try to cut a deal because they could potentially make more money going to trial? Uh, I sure hope that's not the reason. Um, uh, I, I, no, I, I think the big difference between a, having been both a public defender and, and now for a long time private uh, defense attorney, I think the difference is just simply that we have a lot more time to spend on a case as a, uh, as a private attorney. I, I think that public defenders, uh, the vast majority of public defenders are really trying and uh, are, are doing the right thing within the limitations they've got. Uh, I would say that as a private attorney, I've got a lot, I've got the luxury of time. We can look more carefully at the cases. We can go uh, fact by fact and, uh, determine whether we think the state is going to uh, have weaknesses. Often my clients have enough money to hire the right uh, uh, experts. And uh, we've got a cadre of, of good experts on most issues who can review and, and determine whether the state is uh, following, uh, whether the state is, is following proper procedure or whether they have uh, issues that we are going to be able to exploit in, uh, in showing weaknesses in their case. Uh, so, I mean, it costs more to hire a pub, uh, to hire a private attorney than it does a public defender because I hope you're getting more, yeah. And, yeah. and and you're certainly getting the luxury of uh, getting an opportunity to spend time with the lawyer and learning what's important, what matters. A lot of people have mis uh, uh, incorrect assumptions about what matters and about how a case is going to be able to be presented and about what's going to be convincing. And much of my job is, is teaching the clients what matters and, and how, how judges and juries are likely to think about the things they're saying. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I'm assuming you've had a lot of tough conversations with clients, regardless of whether it was court appointed versus a private client, you know, trying to tell yeah. them what they well, should do. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, the, the distinction that I find between the clients that are appointed and the clients that have chosen to have me are that the clients that are appointed are a little suspicious of my motives. And they're, one of the things that people are told when they apply for public defenders, at least in North Carolina, is that if they are convicted, they're going to have to pay for their public defender, something. It's less than it would be to hire a private attorney, obviously. But mm -hmm. they, but that if they're found not guilty, that they won't have to pay anything for the, oh. the public defender's work. And what people hear when they're told that is, oh, so my lawyer only gets paid if I'm found guilty, which oh. is wrong. That's not true. Public yeah. defender's getting paid a salary. It has nothing to do with the outcome of the case. It's a straight salary. Just to be very clear about that. 
Um, but you know, people who don't understand the system very well get confused by that and, and believe that their lawyer has a motive to get them convicted. And that they also are working for the state, which means they must not have the client's best interest at heart. Mm -hmm. As a private attorney, you know, they, they chose me and they paid me and they, uh, and they, because of that value my advice more. Uh, and I, I don't, there is a stigma that comes with having to use a public defender that I don't have to deal with as a private attorney. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't know if you feel comfortable answering this, but do you typically um, get a flat fee or do you sometimes charge people by the hour? No, we, we charge a flat fee. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, typical yeah. for most criminal defense attorneys? Uh, hang on, let me let me be clear. We have yes. a flat fee for depending on what we're doing. So for each level of court, we charge a little more. Sometimes cases have to go up and and they get more expensive as we go up. Uh, we charge a certain fee for a plea, and then we charge a higher fee for going to trial because it's a lot more work. Uh, but uh, and I'm sorry, what was your question? Do most people do it that way? I have no idea. Oh, okay, okay, just wondering. Okay, so we have a couple of people with sort of the same question, like what are the characteristics of an ideal client or what criteria do you use in deciding whether to take on a client or a case? Uh, well, uh, I... Uh, First, the conflict I, check, right? Yes, of course. Yeah, we, we check to make sure that that we don't represent the person on the... that we don't represent the victim or the alleged victim. Uh, uh, or that there's some other conflict that would create a problem, or we don't represent a co-defendant, uh, that could be a problem as well. And then a uh, question about a red flag. It, I mean, I occasionally have people ask to hire me who just uh, don't, who, who are extremely argumentative and are not listening, or who are telling me things that just can't possibly be true, uh, or who seem crazy. And I, I try not to take those cases. Anybody else that I think could benefit from our help and who is interested in our help, uh, I, I would almost certainly take that case. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, I, I'm assuming that a lot of people you've run into are kind of crazy, right? No, I mean, it's more than anything. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I guess it's you know, more than the average population uh, that I that I encounter on a daily basis. But uh, no, I, I think most of the people that we represent are people who uh, are average folks who uh, uh, have run into very difficult circumstances and who uh, occasionally are people who have made terrible choices. Uh, but no, I, I, I wouldn't say that most of them are crazy. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like you said, there are plenty of good people who are professionals, but yet sometimes under pressure or extreme stress or, you know, provocation, they commit a crime or fly off the handle. Or, or they're, I mean, I, I represent a lot of innocent people too. So yes, that too. sometimes people are accused and they didn't do it. Uh, but for those who did, uh, I, I would, uh, I mean, there, there's, there is a saying that I've heard uh, a lot more frequently the last few years that uh, it's terrible to be judged on your worst day. And uh, you know, people have bad days and they sometimes do bad things. And that's not the whole story of who they are. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Was sure. there some, in, some injustice you saw as a child or young person within your family or community that influenced you to become a lawyer? No. Uh, uh, that is not what happened. Uh, that came not as a child, at least, uh, m the, other than my father and my grandfather, almost all of the men for two generations in my family were lawyers. And I was sort of without realizing it, I was kind of molded into, uh, this before uh, I decided to go to law school. But when I went to law school, I thought I was going to law school to become a prosecutor. And I, learn, I guess I was kind of naive when I was thinking about that. I was naive when I was thinking about that because what I discovered my first year of law school was how biased everything was toward the prosecution and that, uh, that people 
want to believe that the police and the prosecution are all doing the right thing and that they're all that they're always right and, and that people wouldn't be accused if they weren't uh, if they hadn't done something wrong. And uh, even now, as we have seen the, the pendulum has swung a little bit back towards center, but uh, but yeah, the, the bias is, is so much for the state and the resources that are available uh, to the state are, are huge and overwhelming. And I, I came to believe that prosecution side just really didn't need my help and that the, the place where I needed to be to try to balance things out was on the side of the accused. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And um, criminal law says, uh, defending criminals can be dangerous. I make it a practice not to take on cases that involve organized crime, for example. So what's your feeling about that? Have you felt in danger? Uh, uh, no, I, I have only ever had one person threaten to take a swing at me. And my defense was that I stepped back about six inches because he was chained to the wall at the time. Oh, and no. I'm, I, you know, I'm 30 years in at this point. No, no, no one has ever threatened me or scared me. I, I we did have a situation one time where, <laughs> where a fella came in off the street and I brought him back in my office and I was talking with him about a probation violation that he had uh, where he, he was on probation. He had just come right from his probation officer and he was very, very upset in a very high state of emotion uh, because he thought he was going to get locked up. And he and I had been talking for probably 20 minutes when I got a call from my law partner who asked, are you okay? And I said, yeah, why? And he said, uh, well, the police are here and they're saying that you have a dangerous uh, criminal in your office and uh, they're here with a, an arrest warrant. And I said, uh, all right, I'm going to finish talking to him and then they, they, uh, they can take him. And we, we talked for probably another half hour during which I gave him advice about how to deal with the, I didn't tell him the police were outside, but I, cause that could have created a problem, but I did tell him uh, how to deal with the police and how to talk with the police. I gave him some advice about things not to say uh, uh, because he needed to protect himself and not give up his, uh, his, his right not to speak. And, um, and then uh, I, I walked him out. I shook his hand and he, uh, he walked out onto the street where the police arrested him. Uh, so I mean, most of the time, the people who are in trouble are not coming to us to threaten us. They're coming to us because they need our help. And uh, they really are doing their dead level best to show us their, their best side. And uh, so, no, I, I, I've never felt afraid. Mm -hmm. Okay, good to hear. Okay, this is a good question. Is it better for a defendant to have a bench or jury trial? Uh, 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 just a few years ago, the law changed in North Carolina to give us the option of waiving a jury and instead ha having a trial in front of a judge. I've never done it, and I don't expect I ever will. Uh, a jury, I mentioned earlier that I, I teach trial advocacy, and what that means is that I, I teach people how to go to trial. And at the, the, the culmination of the class is that we have a mock trial. And generally for those mock trials, we'll get volunteers to come where well, sometimes we'll pay them a little bit. But usually we pay them in pizza, but they, they'll come in to, to sit at, uh, on the trial and, uh, and listen to the facts. And I mean, nobody thinks this is a real trial. This is it's obviously fake. Uh, the people who are doing it are either... Uh, lawyers who have uh, come in from all over the country to 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 sharpen their uh, trial skills, or they are students at UNC where I teach. It's I teach basically the same course in in those two settings, um, and then they, so they make their presentation. They they call fake witnesses. They they cross examine them and direct examine them, and they they make their closing argument. And then we put the jury in a, uh, a room to let them deliberate, but we have a camera in the room and we watch, we tell them, it's not a secret. They know. Uh, and the, the jurors really try to do the right thing. They fight hard. They argue with each other. Uh, they, uh, they 
put their heart into trying to get this right. And that more than anything that I've done in my career as a lawyer has given me great faith in the jury system. I, I think that uh, people really, really try. The only time that I would ever consider a bench trial would be if our argument was about the law and what, and if, if I thought we had a really strong legal argument that was technical in some way and that, uh, that a, a jury might not understand. But even then, I'd, I'd be hard-pressed to give up the right to go in front of 12 citizens. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, there are so many questions. I don't think we can address all of them in under an hour. So, but thank you guys for joining in. We're going to try to wind it down because it is a Sunday and Seth has tons of cases and things to do. Um, okay. This is an interesting question. Why do so many people agree to a police interrogation without an attorney? Present? It's a great question. Uh, I think everybody thinks on some level that if they could just tell their story and get the police to understand, they would see how innocent they were or how right they were to do what they did. And it's not true. The police, I mean, the, if you think about the Miranda warnings, the part of the reason for the Miranda warnings is just to make it very clear the police are not your friends and they are not on your side and you should be afraid because they're, they're there to get information to be used to convict you. So don't talk to them. Uh, I, I think that people gra greatly overestimate their ability to persuade a police officer as to their own innocence or, or to the, the rectitude of their position. They just don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. I, I used to uh, speak at, a, at, at an English as a second language class regularly uh, every six months or so. And I would make everybody in their uh, in their broken English as they were learning to speak English, repeat after me, I want a lawyer, I don't want to talk to you. And I would make them say it over and over until they said it, said it clearly. So folks, uh, if you're ever in the situation, I don't want to talk to you, I want a lawyer, you can't be wishy-washy about it. You can't say, do I need a lawyer? I'm thinking about getting a lawyer. You have to say, I don't want to talk. I want a lawyer, I don't want to talk to you. And the police at that point have to stop Inter interview. They have to stop talking with you. And uh, sometimes people think if I just talk to the police, they'll let me go. And in fact, sometimes the police say, if you just talk to me, I'll let you go or words to that effect. Hey, we just, we don't know what's going on. You, you can really clear things up. It would really help us out. It's going to be a lot easier for you if you just tell us what's going on. It, uh, don't, don't fall for that. Um, even if you get arrested, it's better for you almost always for you not to have spoken to the police. Uh, than to tell them something that they can use against you. Because it's not going to get accurately reported and it's not going to get fairly weighed and it's going to be used against you. If it can be twisted, it will. Mm -hmm. Well, what if what if a defendant says they're going to talk to the police but then doesn't show up the next day to speak with the police? Could that even be admissible at a trial potentially? Uh, could it be admissible if they said they were going to do it and then they decided not to? Yeah. I mean, probably they could they could tell that story for whatever it's worth. I, I have a lot of people call me at that point where they, they have been approached by the police. This, this is what you do if you are approached by the police. Call a lawyer and then let the lawyer have that conversation with the police. Because the conversation that I generally have is I've got a guy here. He says that you want to talk with him. I'm not going to let him talk with you. But if you have I'm not going to let him talk with you directly. But if you have questions, tell me what they are. And. Uh, sometimes the police, I mean, usually the police will say, no, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to go through a lawyer if I can't, I mean, this is implied, they don't say it out loud. If I can't manipulate and pressure and trick the person I'm investigating, then I don't have any, I don't have any, I don't see any benefit to having that conversation. But occasionally the police will tell me what they want. When they do, we don't usually answer the question, but sometimes we do, if we think it's in the best interest of the defendant to, uh, to explain what was going on. Uh, the benefit, among the benefit of having a lawyer is that I've done this a lot and I can usually tell when it's going to be helpful and when it's going to just be terrible to respond to the police. But also, if I respond, here's what happened, officer. That's me talking. That's not my client. And usually that works well for my client because I wouldn't say it if I didn't think it was going to be helpful. 
I would just say, we're not going to talk with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, but if I do say something stupid, it's me saying it. It's not my client. And they can't really use that against my client. They can't say, well, his lawyer said, because I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm not a, a witness. And I'm not a party. And they can't use, uh, they can't use that against my client. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And Mary wants to know, why are grand juries used? It seems that feds use them quite often. Uh, wow. Well, uh, so there are several ways for a case to get in front of a jury. Uh, one of them is through indictment in front of a, a grand jury where the idea is that the evidence is presented to a group of citizens, people who don't have legal training, and that they weigh the evidence to determine whether there is enough uh, evidence there to justify the case going to trial. Why do we do that? Because once upon a time, we that that had uh, real meaning. And once upon a time, uh, citizens were stopping garbage cases from getting into court. There is a, a there is a saying that a, a talented uh, I mean, well, not even talented, that a prosecutor that's worth his salt or her salt could indict, depending on who you're asking, either a ham sandwich or a potted plant. And, uh, and I've heard it said both ways. Um, it doesn't take very much in the, in North Carolina, in the state system, at least the defense doesn't get to be there. We don't get to hear what's said. Uh, we don't get to see a transcript of what's said. It's just, uh, this form formal thing where the prosecution will bring in the lead detective. The lead detective will summarize the evidence that's been, uh, that's been gathered. And then the, grand jury will be asked, well, do you, do you think that it's likely, not even more likely than not, just do you think it's likely that the defendant committed this crime? And if they find that, yes, it's likely, then the case goes up to Superior Court where there can be a trial. Uh, there are other fora, forums where uh, uh, the defense gets to ask questions or where the defense at least gets to be present and those things can be useful. I, honestly, I don't know why we do it, uh, because there are there are other ways for the case to get moved to superior court that are easier and cheaper and faster. And I, I don't know what benefit we're getting out of uh, out of grand juries at this point. Mm -hmm. OK, OK, this is a good question. Thank you. Five car five. Is there any one case that really caught your attention and you followed till a verdict? Any one case that I didn't, where I wasn't involved. Yeah, where you weren't the attorney. No. When I go <laughs> home, I, I want to do anything other than pay attention to other people's cases. So, no. Okay. Yeah, that's basically what a lot of other attorneys told me, too. They're like, I don't have time to follow more criminal cases. <laughs> you know, that's what they do for a living. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm sorry. Home. Yeah, so I'm assuming you don't know about the proper one murder case in dc that was 2006 right no idea okay yeah um let's see do you do any appellate work uh no i don't okay and um oh this is funny well hang on okay. i'm sorry wait wait i i, I will i don't do direct appellate work i do something called motions for appropriate relief mm -hmm. where people who have been convicted uh need someone to go back through the evidence to see whether there has been any, whether anybody cheated or uh, if there is, let's say uh, a witness has recanted and they're now ch telling a different story. I do handle those cases. And that is, that's not a direct appeal, but it is a kind of appellate work. Mm -hmm. Okay. And okay. This is interesting. Does being a lawyer mean you will become rich? <laughs> no, oh, absolutely not. Maybe, maybe at some point. Yeah. <laughs> Not yet. I've been at it for 30 years and no, not yet. Uh, okay. the, what it does mean is you'll never starve. Uh, I, I don't know a whole lot of unemployed lawyers. If you want to work, you'll find work. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like there probably are a lot of unemployed young law school graduates yes. oh, who never fair. got a that's career fair. going. Uh, I guess that's probably true. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. Have you thought about becoming a judge? I have put my name in a couple of times uh, for cases where people were being appointed, but uh, so far other people have gotten those uh, positions. It, it's not something that uh, I 
have as a real career goal. I like to think I'd be good at it, but, uh, and I, and I like to think that it would give me an opportunity to give back to a community that is, that I love. Uh, uh, but no, it's not, it, it, I, I like what I'm doing and uh, I, I'd like to keep doing it for as long as possible. Okay, great. Um, I'm putting your website in there just in case anyone has any issues in Wake County, North Carolina. Okay, deep dive true crime. He's an attorney in Florida who uh -huh. has a big YouTube channel about true crime. So he wants to know, did a defendant talking at an interrogation ever help? Uh, I think that, uh, so I do represent a lot of people who, uh, have not yet been charged, but who are afraid that they're going to be charged. And I have had a number of cases where we have given responses, uh, to the police and shown that they, that the case, uh, that the police think they have is a weak case. Uh, so Yes. Did, but if you're asking, did a defendant ever talking in an interrogation without a lawyer present ever helped? I don't think I would know the answer to that. I think that uh, if somebody talked themselves out of being charged with a crime, they wouldn't have ever come to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And but my my sense is probably not very often. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have a question for you that I thought up myself, because in the Dan Markell case, there have already been two trials against people who were um, against the actual shooter and someone who was alleged to be the go-between between between the victim's ex-wife's family and the shooter. So um, the ex-wife, Wendy Adelson, was given limited immunity to testify at both trials. Okay. Um, and there's some question as to whether the ex-wife is going to testify at the next trial, which is against her brother. Um, if someone refuses to testify when they're subpoenaed to come to trial, but there's prior testimony, can that just be played or read? instead of probably. that person being a witness at the next Pro trial. Yeah, pro probably. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'd have to know a little bit more. There could be cases where it was problematic in some way, but uh, if the person testified and they were subject to cross-examination, yes, as she was twice, apparently, mm -hmm. then it's. I, I would guess it's likely that's going to come in. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, the concern is usually whether the prior testimony is credible and whether there were what we call indicia of reliability in the, uh, in the statements that were made. And in that kind of situation where, I mean, you, you have somebody on both sides who, uh, is tasked with ensuring that the evidence that's coming in is, is proper evidence. And you've got a judge sitting in both situations where she's testified before making sure that the rules are followed. And at this point, I assume there has been an appellate review of, of both of those, or there's going to be, it's mm -hmm. hard to imagine a situation where there would be, be better indicia of reliability uh, to the evidence. So my, my quick and dirty opinion is that okay. that's probably coming in. Yeah, yeah, because I did look up the Florida statute about uh, prior testimony or what to do if a witness becomes unavailable, that, mm -hmm. you know, there would be a hearsay exception to just bring in prior testimony. Well, that doesn't sound like she's unavailable. She, she Yeah, what if she just that... refuses and says, well, this time I'm not coming back? Well, they could subpoena like, her. They, I mean, they, they yeah. could pull her in against her will. That's, that's the nature of a subpoena. Uh, mm -hmm. But if she sits on the stand and says, I will not answer your questions, then mm -hmm. there's an opportunity for what we call impeachment, where uh, her state, her old statements can be put in front of her and the questions can be, you said that, you said that, you said that. Uh, mm -hmm. Or they can play them on video and, and, and show you said that, you said that's you, right? <laughs> um, and mm -hmm. so, yeah, I mean, that stuff probably is going to come in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Well, um, let's see. Oh, okay. I'm not sure 
Mary wants to know, what do you think of cooperating witnesses? I mean, I guess you want witnesses to, to cooperate if they're going to help your client, right? Well, I, I, I assume that Mary is asking about people who are uh, testifying. Uh, Mary, please tell me if I'm getting this wrong. People who are testifying against the defendant, people who are cooperating with the state. And uh, uh, that comes up a lot. I mean, it comes up all the time. But uh, it comes up a lot where somebody has been in either uh, they, they have a co-defendant who's testifying against them uh, or occasionally we have a situation where somebody has been in custody for a long time and somebody else who knows them from jail uh, contacts the police and says, hey, guess what other defendant told me? Uh, I'd be glad to testify about it if I got some kind of break on my case. And uh, uh, those, I, I think, I mean, my opinion about the prison snitch or the jail mm -hmm. snitch is yeah. that those, those should be treated with, with great suspicion. Uh, as to a cooperating co-defendant, um, I, I mean, the, they obviously have a uh, motive to lie or to, or to make things seem worse for the other person. And th those should also be uh, treated with some suspicion. Uh, it is appropriate for the defense attorney to ask those questions and to show the jury that this is a real concern and, and to undercut their credibility in that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, one more question from me. Um, what would you want your client to testify? Or do you typically tell the client not to get up there and testify? I would have to make a decision on, so let me, let me say, first of all, whether a client gets to testify at a trial is entirely the, the decision of the client. They, they, there are two things where if I don't agree, the client gets to make the call. One of them is on whether to plead guilty or not guilty. The other is on whether they testify. But as to what I would advise, uh, I uh, would make a determination about whether, first of all, I think my client is credible because there are people who just don't speak well. And there are people who just come off as uh, they, they, they seem you know, kind of shady uh, when they talk. And, and things like that can affect whether a jury is, is likely to believe them, whether they're telling the truth or not. Uh, and not that I ever know, you know whether they're telling the truth, but, uh, uh, but assuming that, uh, uh, that, they, that I believe they are telling the truth, uh, I might still tell somebody that they're, 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 they could hurt themselves by testifying. Uh, in situations where somebody is defending themselves uh, or uh, is the only person who can tell a story, uh, we would probably want those people to testify. Uh, in situations where we think our client is um, is sympathetic in some way, we might want that that person to testify. Uh, it's worth saying if I if I believe that my client is lying, I think the rule is if I know my client is lying, but I don't ever really know. Uh, but if I believe my client is lying, that I have to tell them it's a bad idea to lie. And then if they still want to testify, I have to let them. But I the the rule is that we put them on the stand, we ask them their name, and then we say, okay, what do you want to tell us? And, and then I don't ask follow-up questions, or I, I might ask anything else. Um, and then I don't ask follow-up questions. And it, it is um, understood to be a signal to the, the judge and the other side that I don't believe this guy. Uh, that, that I can't, I don't think I've ever had to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. But the, that's the rule. Okay, great. Okay. Well, it's been over an hour. So thank you so much for your you. time. Um, any closing remarks to the audience out there about uh, you, no, lawyer no. or your practice in general? Uh, golly, I, I didn't practice any uh, closing remarks, but I will say okay. don't uh, don't talk to the police unless you have to. Uh, <laughs> if you are a suspect, okay. don't talk to the police, don't talk to the police, don't talk to the police, get a lawyer to do it for you. Uh, if I can help, you're more than welcome to call me again. And uh, Judy, uh, thank you for this opportunity. It's been a great sure. time. Okay, thank you so much. So why don't you hang on for another minute and we'll go ahead and say goodbye to everybody 
out there on YouTube. So thanks, everybody. Have a good week. Bye.